Uh, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. He uh, actually is foundational for the quality program at my company. Um, he started in 2003 at Silver and Hansen and worked on the coffee buying and sourcing uh, from that point until last year when he founded a new company uh, for green sourcing uh, at the wholesale level. Uh, and that is Morten Venusgaard. Please, welcome. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm glad to be here um, and I'm really glad to be able to talk about something I'm really passionate about, uh, sourcing coffee and particularly sourcing coffee from Africa. Um, I'll, um, I mean, Nordic Approach, like you say, it's a new company. Um, we are a green coffee importer uh, sourcing company that are trying to uh, basically work actively in origin to get hold of, uh, uh, let's say, value-added coffees and better coffees for the, for the um, to begin with, for the European market. Uh, there's been a huge or big decrease in the number of roasters that are requiring um, uh, a broader range of coffees as well as they're um, getting more uh, uh, educated and uh, are moving uh, towards uh, kind of really specific, uh, specific uh, quality levels. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, about our sourcing philosophy before we actually start uh, uh, going into Africa. I mean, like, uh, like Peter was saying, um, flavors for us is a result of, you know, varietals, soil, farmer practices, uh, he mentioned pruning. I mean, all these things are actually the, the stuff that are making the coffee taste good. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, not that a wet meal. For sure, you have to um, you have to control the process at the wet mill, but you can't really improve a bad coffee at the mill. So, um, and I think that's something that, I mean, there's been a lot of focus on, you know, processing methods and everything, but and maybe for, for the consumer or for the, for the roasters, less focused on, on what's actually going on in the field. Um, uh, but hopefully that will change. That said, I mean, we're going to talk about Africa and they're able to, to get out great coffees without hardly doing anything in the field. So, I mean, it's a complex thing, but anyway. Um, we think it's really, really important to think long-term uh, working with the producers. And that's because, uh, you know, to be consistent in terms of quality, you have to actually invest. And, uh, you know, when the market goes up and down like it's been doing the last couple of years and you never know what prices you're going to get, it's really hard for a producer, even if you want to go into quality, it's, it's going to be really hard for him to actually take that step uh, because it, it can be a big risk. So, so we really think that building relations with producers, trying to work consistently, trying to commit to coffees uh, year to year um, is, is, is crucial. Um, and, you know, together with those things, paying well is another thing that's, that's, uh, that really matters. Uh, and I'm going to show you some breakdown of costs later, but uh, you have to give them economic incentives to continue working progressively on, on quality. Um, another thing that, you know, that is very, very important if you're going to access quality is lot separation because there's no producers, no producers in the world actually that are able to produce only, you know, the top grades or the top qualities. Every farm, every cooperative will have different qualities. And if you're not separating out those qualities or those lots, it'll be impossible to, let's say, maximize your market. So if you're able to do lot separation, uh, have, if you, as a farmer producer, have access to cupping labs, whatever, where you can actually actually differentiate the product and target them to the right markets, it'll, it'll be a huge benefit. And for us, trying to find coffees, it's, it's impossible if there is no separation at the wet mills or the farms. 
Yeah, uh, going into going into Africa. Um, I mean, I'll try to cover this in whatever it's left, like 25 minutes, or and it's it's not a lot, a lot of time to to go into in depth in what's going on there. But I'll try to um, just talk a little bit in general and then narrow it down to uh, what we do when we're actually there and and working to find the. Uh, um, and source source the source the trophies. Uh, I spent uh, about five months last year when I when I left Solberg and started this company. I spent the first five months in Africa, um, and that was really helpful for me to understand you know the whole the whole range of, or, or the whole chain of operations there, which I think is is also very very important because there's been you know there's always a lot of of. Um, uh, attention to what's going on at the farm or at the at the wet mill, but I mean there's a there's a there's a whole range of, of things that are connected. Like you you need good services for export, you need good dry millers, you need all these kind of things. And and staying there for a longer period of time really made me understand more of the complexity of the of the whole industry, which is great. So I'll just uh, show you a little bit of uh, of. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into numbers, but this is just to show you uh, what, what's going on in, in uh, East Africa. These numbers, I think they're from 2010, so maybe they're not really accurate for, for last year's uh, harvest, but anyway. Uh, when we're talking about quality coffee in Africa, it's East Africa. Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of things going on there now. Uh, we are focusing mainly on Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Rwanda and Burundi. There's a lot of things going on in Uganda. Um, I haven't really uh, gone into that yet, but I, I, I know it's a little inconsistent. They don't really have the structure and, and stuff like that, but I think uh, there, will be, there will probably be great products coming out of there if you just find the right uh, places and, and people. And uh, yeah, uh, as goes for Tanzania, we, we have decided for now not to work too much in, in Tanzania. So, um, this is uh, this is basically. Uh, I just want to show you this picture because it's a it's a kind of standard setup for a washing station. Wh when we're working in Africa, we're working right now. We're working 100% with smallholders and wet mills. We're not working with the states. Um, we might do in the future, but right now we find I find the more interesting coffees coming from from smallholders and cooperatives and wet mills or private wet mills or wet mill owners. So basically, this is a typical wet mill. The setup is is more or less the same for for all the all the countries when we're talking about this is the traditional wet mills. I'll show you uh, or I'll talk a little bit about uh, the kind of uh, different uh, different wet mills that people are setting up today. But anyway, this is, uh, you have, you know, the reception point on the left and then the coffee is pulped and going into fermentation tanks and, and graded and then it's dried on the tables. And all, all these uh, wet mills, if it's a private, uh, private um, wet mill owner or if it's a cooperative, they're buying their cherries normally from the surrounding areas. From smallholders that, that might have, you know, garden coffees, it's, uh, it can be two to seven, eight hundred trees, whatever, and they're producing maybe something equal to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 kgs of green per tree. So, I mean, to, to be able to do a, a good amount of production, you're buying, normally you're buying cherries from thousands of farmers. Um, what makes Africa so appealing and interesting um, to me? Um, First of all, I mean, there is thousands of varietals, especially if you're looking into to Ethiopia. Uh, I mean, nobody knows, but there, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, local forest coffees that are taken down to the gardens. But even in other countries where you talk of one varietal, there's actually normally more because there's different generations and there's, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Rwanda, Burundi is examples. They, they talk about it as, as Bourbon. But when you go into a field and you look at the trees, I mean, they are very different. They are branch tipped. They are, you know, you can, you can just see there is different generations and different varietals. So, um, unfortunately, there's not always, it's not always possible to actually go in and look at <coughs> what varietals there are in all the different areas. But uh, I think there's 
there's a lot of progress on research, so we will know much more um, for the next coming years. There's very fertile, fertile soils. I mean, even like I said, even if they hardly do anything with their trees, sometimes I mean they can have a, a good production just doing some basic mulching, some uh, organic compost. They can increase their production uh, by 200 percent or whatever. Uh, and there's also big differences in soil um, uh, contents. You know, looking again, if you look at Rwanda, for instance, it's a big difference from south and north. There is much more volcanic stuff in the north and. And this really makes a great uh, diversity of flavors and products. And there's a lot of undiscovered areas still. I mean, so, I mean, like Ethiopia, there is a project there from TechnoServe where they've been going into areas. There's a lot of coffee there, but previously they've been doing uh, naturals, more or less low graded naturals. And now they established a lot of cooperatives. Uh, that are doing wash coffees in areas where we never had that kind of uh, clean, transparent coffees before. So what it does is that it, it reveals uh, a, a huge range of different uh, flavor profiles. Um, we're going to go, we're actually going to cup some of those uh, later on. There's a lot of entrepreneurship, um, both on farmer levels and also on, you know, cooperative level, washing station level. Uh, and there's a lot of will, uh, so it's really, it's really, um, uh, it's really encouraging to to work there because when you s are getting into the uh, to the relations, uh, it's really they are they are not known, uh, they are not very familiar with being you know getting their knowledge for what they do. So um, it's. Uh, it's really, um, yeah, whatever. It's really, it's really great as a buyer to to see that uh, spirit and enthusiasm. Um, there's a great selection of products. Basically, like I said, because there's so many areas, there's so many uh, producers. A lot of it is still blended. So when you actually go into an area where you know you have just like a type of coffee blended from many washing stations, and you go in and start to separate, there are there, there's a, a lot of good uh, things to choose from, and even from one washing station, because they're, uh, some of them are at, at could be at pretty big sizes. They could produce everything from two to five containers of coffee. And again, when they're breaking stuff down into daily lots, you could go into a washing station and you can cut through like 60, 60 different coffees from one producer. Um, and what we see now, because because uh, of all the all the things going on and uh, when you start to discover all these new coffees there is a huge range of, of profiles. People you know tend to think of Africa it should be like the you know the very intense uh, Kenyans or it should be like the typical southern Ethiopian um, but there's also a huge range of other let's more let's say more subtle coffees uh, big bold rich uh, stuff that could easily, in my opinion, replace a lot of other, other, um, other traditional coffee origins. Um, so I think it's really, it's really important to be open-minded. And for me, as a buyer, that's also something that's really inspiring. You know, just not trying to do what everybody's been doing before you, but try to go in and look at different areas. Uh, and find different products. And for me now, it's I, I'm really hoping to find a market for those uh, those coffees because I'm I I mean I know they have a place in the in the quality segment, but it's just a matter of time and when people are discovering um, their attributes. So, you know, to work with sourcing, I mean, what's what's essential and traveling, of course. Uh, for me at this point has been like really, really important. Um, building structures, uh, no, understand the structure of the industry and building network is the only way to access coffee. I mean, unless you just had to go somewhere and buy something that you heard of and know people are buying before you. But if you're gonna discover new stuff and find new products, you really have to be there um, a lot. And I mean, I've been traveling back and forth for like almost 10 years. and. And still I feel like I'm a novice. I mean, I'm still just like starting to understand what's actually going on and how to 
how to systematically search for for the good um, for the great coffees. Um, I just want to go quickly through the chain of operations, um, and like I said, there's a there's a whole chain that are they're all playing a very important part but because you can find a great coffee, but it's not necessarily so that it's landing landing uh, as good as it was when you copped it just straight from the farm. But anyway, I mean, we talked a little bit about, or uh, Peter talked about planting and fertilization and pruning, so that's uh, for sure like the most important, uh, important step. But then you have the wet meal, and there's so many things that can be done and go wrong um, to ensure quality. I mean, first thing is the cherry reception. Uh, as a wet miller or a, or a, or a, a producer, you have to control the, the quality of the cherries coming in. Um, processing is for sure another very important factor. How it's processed and the quality control you do during the, um, during the actual processing. Uh, like I said, I mean, I'm talking about wash coffees now. Um, like I said, there is, you know, you have different kind of pulping equipment to remove the fruit, you have different kind of methods for fermentation, you have dry, wet, whatever. Um, and there's also a lot of progress actually on, on that, uh, uh, on the actual pulping and, uh, and fermentation part. Um, a lot separation, like I said, is crucial. And storage is something that people don't really pay too much attention to. But if you, if you do produce a great coffee at the wet mill and then you just take it down to a storage where you have like high humidity, high temperature, whatever, it'll ruin the product. So making sure that wherever the storage uh, is, and you have to make sure that the coffee after the, after the processing is taken well care of. Um, you have... Uh, the dry mill, which is as important because there as well, you, can, you cannot improve the, the quality, but you can for sure ruin it. And uh, for those who don't know, I mean, dry milling is about whenever a coffee is finished at the wet mill, it's still in parchment. Um, and then before it's exported, it'll be dry mill, it'll be hulled, where you remove the parchment you, uh, you do the grading and you do the preparation of the coffee before it's going into bags and get exported. Uh, the dry mill is also normally or very often responsible for the finance together with the producer or, or towards the producer. They normally have to analyze the product and do a, a job on quality control as well. Uh, Cupping is for sure crucial if you're a, if you're a serious dry miller. Or a, you know, sometimes dry millers and exporters are the same thing, but, but either way, I mean, they have to control their products, you know, uh, to make sure they have, uh, basically to make sure the quality is still there and if they are buying the product from the, from the producers, what, uh, they have to make sure they're paying the right price for their right uh, product. Um, the exporter, they are normally buying, like we are doing the FOB, I'm not gonna go into that, but uh, FOB meaning I, I'm contracting the coffee from the port. So normally the exporter would have to buy the coffee. When I, even if I'm doing a direct um, trade with, uh, with a, let's say a wet mill, when they are leaving the coffee over to the dry mill or the exporter, they wanna get paid immediately. So normally the exporter will finance that coffee for me, pay the producer, and then I will pay him FOB, meaning I will pay him uh, when the coffee is coming to, to Europe or when the documents for the coffee arrives. Um, and they will also normally control the, control the, you know, the packaging and the grading and the hand picking to make sure the, the, the right sorting and grading is there. So, like I said, I mean, it's not enough only to build, you know, relations to a wet mill. You have to make sure that the product is taken well care of in the whole chain. And so that's why it's, why it's super important. And some people say, you know, I don't want to buy the export or pay the export. I want to buy the, I want to pay the, the farmer. But in fact, I mean, they all have a, a place in the chain. And then it, if they do a good job, they should all, you know, uh, make, 
be able to profit on, on what they do. So, um, I'm just going to show you an example of uh, cost breakdown. How am I doing on time? Uh, How much left? Oh, okay. Just like a quick, uh, quick thing on uh, on cost breakdown. I mean, this is an example from one producer I worked with in in Rwanda, um, and basically, uh, he's doing he's doing a lot of of improvements to make a better product. And uh, you know, first of all, in that area, the cherry prices are pretty high, so. Converted from cherry to greens, they're paying like 375 US dollar per kg for the cherries from the farmers. And then they go in a wet mill and they have, because they're having a, a lot of uh, people sorting uh, the coffee at the drying tables and they have a pretty dense uh, operation in terms of, uh, of, uh, of working uh, labor. They are doing like 0.7 US dollar per kg just in, in uh, operational cost at the wet mill. Uh, dry milling uh, will cost them, like that's normally kind of a fixed thing, that will cost them 0 point, uh, 0, uh, 0.45 US dollars. So the production cost is like roughly 490. And I'm not taking, I mean, not considering, you know, the investment they've done, like buying the mill and everything. This is just like the production cost. If you look at the New York prices today, uh, and uh, let's say you can sell the uh, average good Rwandan at plus 30, that will be like 460 US dollars per kg, meaning they're losing 30 cents. Uh, and who want to risk that? Because again, if you don't have the relation and the long-term thing, it will be very, very risky for a producer going into that kind of production if you don't know where the New York Sea market is next year, if you don't know, you know, the differentials it's going to get. So this is why, uh, we really want to give like good incentives in terms of paying them well for them to be able to foresee and start budgeting in terms of uh, producing better coffees and investing quality. I mean, in the end, it's ridiculously cheap. When you know how much work there's going into every kg of coffee, especially the, the good ones, I mean, we have to, together, we have to get the consumers more aware of the prices on on uh, the cost of production. And that's why we think it's important to be transparent because I think that's a very, that's the only way to actually educate the market. Um, okay, I'm gonna go very quickly to the, through some of the, uh, through the countries we're gonna cup coffees from. Um, uh, I mean, the way we work in Kenya is that we traditionally have been working, or I have traditionally before, and we are still doing it, working in central Kenya where everybody works. So we're spending a lot of time there at the mill. We kind of have pinpointed a lot of washing stations that we, or wet mills that we want to work with, and then we just spend a lot of time there at the mill in the area and cupping through all the daily lots that are, or all the daily um, lots they're getting in at the, at the dry mill. Uh, so I don't know, this year we probably cut through, you know, uh, 40, 50 coffees from just like a small number of uh, washing stations and then we picked out uh, the lots we were going to have. The great thing with Kenya is like it's very transparent, it's, it's, they are doing all the lot separation by, by tradition and uh, it's easy to work there in, in that sense. Um, Rwanda is a very young industry. I mean, they've only been doing fully washed coffees for, for about 10 years. They used to, I mean, they have been doing coffee there for a long time, what they call ordinary, which is more or less uh, coffees that are produced, processed at farmer level with a hand pulper and then they dry it on the street or in the gardens or whatever, and the parchment is sold wet. But like 10 years ago, there were some programs initiated by USAID and uh, another, um, uh, and TechnoServe has been there as well, and so, I mean, <coughs> In 10 years, they've really been um, able to develop a great range of quality, but it's still very young, it's still developing, and that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what will hopefully happen in the future uh, at the cupping later on, because uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, um, yeah, all these things are still on a very kind of the beginning stage, but there is more lot separation now. There is more quality millers that are uh, establishing themselves, you know, to be able to 
Normally the, the, the bigger meals, it's, it can be difficult to meal only like 10 to bags, 30 bags, micro loss, whatever, but there's more millers now that are willing to take on, you know, the small, uh, small loss. Um, Ethiopia, totally, completely different. Very long tradition, huge coffee industry. Um, again, there is thousands of uh, varietals uh, and a very kind of strong um, social cooperative system. Um, but what is very, very interesting here is, is the, the project I talked about earlier, where they are going into the different regions and they are also setting up uh, setting up the cooperatives with more modern equipment like uh, something called eco pulpers where you actually don't do fermentation you normally remove the parchment and uh, remove the, the fruit and skin and then you most of them are soaking the, the parchment under water uh, before it's uh, you know dried um, and uh, I mean, to me, this is probably the most amazing thing with Africa right now, the, the, uh, the thing that's going on in Ethiopia. So we're gonna move forward. Um, I'm not gonna do a blind cupping. I were a little forth and back if I'm gonna do blind cupping or not, but uh, we decided, or I decided just to do an open cupping. So what we're gonna cup is like four different Ethiopians from uh, different regions and Actually, um, there's from three different regions. You have Ethiopia, Chiri, and Michiti. They are from the Kaffa region in the west. They are eco um, uh, And they are very close to each other. Still, like I said, there is a lot of native forest coffees all around Ethiopia. And you can look at, so most of the farmers, they're just taking, you know, the, the forest coffee is down to their gardens and they continue to cultivate the, the native varietals. So you can see on the Chiri and the Michiti, you can see huge difference looking at the beans, whatever. So it's like very local, the, 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 the different varietals. And it tastes totally differently, even if they're from more or less from the same place. Negeli Gorbitu is a, a classic uh, Yirga Shefe coffee from the south uh, that is going through, that's been going through the, the, the typical wet fermentation they're doing there. Uh, and then you have uh, a cooperative from the Bello, uh, no, from uh, the Bello cooperative from Limu, uh, which is another area in the west. Uh, they have been doing wash coffees there uh, to some extent, like some, some state owned farms and stuff like that, but this is another new cooperative. They're all, all these uh, cooperatives are at 2,000 meters altitude, and uh, the other fascinating thing is that they're young. Some of them are just on their second year of pr on production and they are very well organized and then been doing a great job on quality. We're gonna do two uh, Rwandan copies. Um, this is from one of the wet mills I'm working with and I just wanna show you the difference. We have been doing uh, a trial for some years or Jay have been doing some trials and I've been part of it. I know him since like 2007 or something, this, uh, this producer. And they started to separate out all the different areas surrounding the washing station because normally all the washing station they're just getting in the cherries from all over and they they uh, process it and maybe they separate it out as a daily lot. But here we've been doing separation based on regions for some years and I've been copying it through uh, uh, through the couple of last years and it's pretty consistent the different flavor profiles from the different areas, which I think is super interesting because we're going to see much more of that in Rwanda in the future, I'm sure. So basically the Remera wet mill, the mixed regions, that's just like a standard coffee he's doing there. And the Cabeza region is uh, a coffee we're buying now that are just uh, from one specific region. Uh, from Kenya, we've been doing a little bit of the same as we're doing like in, uh, in other countries. We've been working in traditionally like in the central uh, Kenya, in Nyeri. This is a coffee that we bought from there, but we also this year moved on to the western part towards Uganda and found some very different products that we still think are great. And that's what I, I, that's what I mean by, I think just if, if, if we are open-minded and not like trying to find a Kenya that is just like a typical Kenya, there is so many opportunities in Africa right now. So we're gonna cut co those two um, together just to see the differences here. So. I okay, can we move to the cupping now, Morton? Is that yep. what we should do? Yep. So let's give a quick round of applause.